overeducated, underskilled. Maybe it's the other way around, I forget. And I'm obsolete. I'm not economically viable. Welcome to the podcast of post postmodern madness and societal decay. Not economically viable. With your entropy coordinator and spirit guide Jay Swift. Welcome, welcome, one and all, to the inaugural edition of Not Economically Viable podcast slash podcast of post-postmodern madness and societal decay. It's your one-stop shop for all things social entropy, and I, for one, am happy to have you aboard. I'm your host, Jay Swift. I guess if you had to boil my essence down to a couple of arbitrary labels, I suppose you could call me an award-winning journalist and a multimedia reporter who's had a couple of dalliances with marketing and PR here and there. Outside of that, I'm a columnist who writes for about 12 different websites and a grade Z YouTube personality if you want to be that generous about things. Also, Wikipedia lists me as an authoritative source on both discontinued Taco Bell items and prison rape in the United States, so you know I must have done something right in my life thus far. Long story short, I've been working on bringing not economically viable fruition for quite some time now. There's no real theme or agenda, just me talking to people with unorthodox, unpopular, and sometimes unsavory opinions on our modern world. This is a safe place, so to speak, for contrarian and countercultural thinkers who loudly and proudly embrace their First Amendment rights to be as abrasive, offensive, and blasphemous as they want. Some of the things my guests talk about are deep and profound, and other times it's super niche and completely irrelevant for 99.9998% of humanity. Either way, we here at Not Economically Viable believes everybody has the basic ingrained right to speak their mind, and if you are one of those people with challenging and contentious perspectives, who wants to be poked, prodded, and provoked on the program, by all means, send us an email, and we'll start with a kid sometimes call a dialogue. Now, we're not just looking for famous or infamous people. If you're just a regular old Joe or Josephine fighting unjust societal norms or good taste just for the principal and you want to have your voice heard, we'll give you a fair hearing. Or at least patronize you a little less than most people would, probably. Lastly, this whole operation is published under Creative Commons licensing. That means you, dear listener or viewer, are free to reprint, republish, and or rebroadcast this program anywhere, anytime, in any place, and you don't have to pay a dime to anybody. So if you hear this on YouTube or SoundCloud or where the hell ever, feel free to copy and paste it all over the webs. After all, it's just as much your show as it is mine. Now, with all that stuff out of the way, time to hop headfirst to our first episode. I recently caught up with the one and only Jim Goad, he of Taki's Mag and the Redneck Manifesto fame, to discuss the media's crusades against President Trump and how a mainstream outlet's oh-so-skewed depiction of Trump voters may have played a much larger role in his election than any amount of Russian meddling. So, without further ado, let's get straight to the meat of the matter, why don't we? All right, well, welcome everyone. As I promised to the inaugural edition of Not Economically Viable, I'm here with the best possible guest we could have for a program like this, the one, the only, Jim Goad. Jim, would you like to introduce yourself? No. <laughs> no, I'm a writer. That's that's about it. And I make more sense than uh, anyone who hates me. I agree. And uh, I do a lot of work for Tacky's Mag. I've written the Redneck Manifesto. You worked on Answer Me. You have a ton of uh, books coming out. Uh, you just had the Answer Me anthology released. Anything else Yes. On? All four issues of Answer Me and a book called The New Church Ladies. The subtitle is The Extremely Uptight World of Social Justice. I have no idea where you get the idea that social justice warriors are uptight about anything. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, it's not like uh, they just want to destroy people because they're offended. Yeah, and it's a little bit of an aside before we get into the, the meat of the argument here, but I was wondering why you haven't sued the people who wrote the liberal Redneck Manifesto by now. You can't sue over a title. There was a band called the Redneck Manifesto in uh, Ireland after my book came out. I don't know why you can't sue over a title, but that would seem to be the one thing you should be allowed to sue over, uh, but you can't. And Simon and Schuster put it out, and they promoted the shit out of that book and gave mine none. So, not too happy about that. And those guys are such uncle, what would they be, Uncle Tim's? Uh, doing a, a minstrel show for Southerners, but uh, pretty much betraying everything the South used to be about. 
well, can we at least book them in a tag team match against you and Joe Bob Briggs? <laughs> well, Joe, I guess, uh, I mean, I never said I was from the South at least, but Joe, Joe's real name is John Bloom and he's from New York city. So that's sort of a character that he does. Yeah, hey, we'll, we'll find somebody out there. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I've ever claimed to be, which I will fight bare knuckle about, is being working class. And that, uh, to, to use a word that's not working class, that informs everything that I do. All right, and that's a great and, segue. And few, and few things annoy me more than wealthy whites lecturing me about how I should uh, feel about being working class. Because I've never had anyone accuse me of privilege or accuse me of kowtowing or worshiping the rich uh, who wasn't uh, much more economically privileged than I was. That is an absolutely perfect segue into the topic <laughs> today. Yeah. So uh, this guy, Donald Trump, he's, I don't know if you know this, he's kind of polarizing. A lot of people like him. A lot of people don't like him. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is he is the president of the United States. He won the Electoral College and he managed to flip some states that Hillary Clinton did not win. So, so I didn't, far, didn't even visit as far as I know in some of those uh, states. Yeah. And to, so far, the media narrative has been, well, the reason Trump won is because, A, everybody who voted for him is a racist, sexist, homophobe who hates Muslims. Uh, B, that all of the states that voted for Trump had laws in place to disenfranchise minorities. And, of course, the big one, the Russia attacked the election and just swung everything wide open. Trump. Why is it so goddamn difficult for minorities to get ID cards? I mean, they need that for driving, yes. No, don't you need an ID card to drive? Um, why Why shouldn't you need an ID card to vote? That seems to be the one thing that no one really complains about. You need to get a fishing license to go to a video store, sometimes even to get a library card. I don't think these people even know what they're implying. If they, They're saying that minorities have trouble getting a basic ID ID card, they're saying minorities are stupid and incapable, and maybe they shouldn't vote. If if they have trouble getting that, then maybe they, they shouldn't vote, is, is all I can say. Disenfranchise. Uh, I mean, these are people who've shit on everyone who lives between New York and L.A. for about two generations now, and they're still scratching their heads as to why these people, quote, vote against their own interests, close quote, which is one of the most condescending phrases I've ever heard. I actually met the guy who came up with that phrase. Thomas Frank, who wrote uh, What's the Matter with Kansas, who started a, a magazine called The Baffler. And a typical upper-middle-class bourgeois neo-socialist. They all are. I've never met a white socialist who doesn't come from a far wealthier background than I do, so there's a special axe to grind there. Uh, and the, But the hatred directed at him is... Uh, Greatly amusing to me. At this point, if anyone still thinks the media is unbiased, they're either stupid or they're a liar. And we'll be getting into that, the granular details, uh -huh. very shortly. So if all these things the media keeps telling us are the reasons why Trump won are not correct, then just in a quick nutshell summary graph, why did Trump get elected? The, well, I... I my case, I voted for him. I'm a felon, but I'm allowed to vote in Georgia. Uh, he talked about everything that mattered to me. I said in the Redneck Manifesto in the 90s, the big story of the 90s wasn't racism, it was outsourcing. My dad grew up in the Great Depression, didn't have a high school education. When he was my age, when he was younger than me, he owned a house in cash, was able to buy a new car every three years, and my mom didn't have to work. That's the America I'd like to get back to when... Uh, he didn't have to be educated to, you know, he worked his balls off. He worked 80 hour weeks as long as I was growing up. He died when I was 19, but he was able to own a house and buy new cars. I don't know anybody who's not incredibly wealthy who, uh, who's able to do that these days, or at least who doesn't have tremendous help from their parents. And in the lead up to the election, one of the most interesting things I heard, especially in hindsight, was from the creator of Dilbert who said, there's no way Trump can lose. Look at his campaign message compared to Hillary's. So when you look at Make America Great Again versus I'm With Her, what's your big takeaway? Why do you think that uh, resonated with you know, blue-collar Americans? 
Again, I mean, she openly shit on these people. She called them deplorables. And I mean, as as someone who's a student of media and a, a journalism graduate, I've you know I've absorbed the disdain that these people have. These protected, sheltered people who live in these coastal bubbles have for most Americans. I think. Uh, I mean, I think there's still a lot of overwhelming self hatred and and economic. Uh, and uh, ethnic masochism among these people. Here's somebody who came along. I went to see him speak in Atlanta in, in uh, January of 2016. He told the audience he loved them. I've never heard a politician say that. And whether or not it's sincere, I think these people felt unloved. And here was somebody, yes, he, he grew up rich. But again, uh, as far as I know, he took his inheritance and multiplied it by 100, which most people don't do. They say, you know, if he just put it in the bank, he would have made more. Well, then why aren't his brother and sister far richer than he is? But he talks like somebody who's mixed cement and driven a truck. And he spoke directly to them. And when I went to see him, you know, you, you get on deadlines for these articles and you know what your topic is, but you don't really know what your angle is until you've absorbed all the information. I went to see him talk and I'm driving home on a cold, rainy uh, Sunday night in January 2016 I'm thinking, well, what's the big criticism? Oh, racist, 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 racist. Huh. He didn't mention race once in his entire speech. He mentioned that uh, Apple was made in China, that carrier air conditioners was going to, were going to Mexico. He talked about outsourcing and the manufacturing base being sold and uh, packed up and sold away. And I think that resonated with a lot of people. Also, Hillary Clinton is absolutely phony and... Uh, you know, it's an overused term, sociopath and narcissist. They use that with Trump all the time. But uh, Hillary Clinton seems bloodless. Bill Clinton, at least, whether it was fake or not, he projected warmth. He was a charismatic person. Hillary Clinton just didn't have that at all. And I like Mexicans and gay people and blacks. Apparently, is no longer a winning strategy. And I don't think she had any message beyond that. Plus, it's pretty obvious she screwed over Bernie Sanders pretty hard. And I think what's ha what happened uh, in 2016 was analogous to what happened with the Republicans in 2012. They didn't even want to acknowledge Ron Paul. I watched that convention in 2012. There were states where Ron Paul won. And, you, you know, ladies and gentlemen, the great state of Nevada, the home of silver in Las Vegas, 27 votes for Ron Paul, seven for Romney. You, you can watch this video and, and they, they go, okay, Nevada, seven for Romney. They didn't even acknowledge Ron Paul's existence. And I think that's what uh, gave Obama the edge in 2012. I think screwing over the Bernie people is probably what killed her. Plus, I think blacks uh, felt patronized by her. I think they stayed home in large numbers. Uh, they, they didn't really show up. They could have given her the edge, too. She had the, uh, the, elect the popular vote, but apparently none of her handlers told her how you win an election that's not the popular vote and trump uh trump was smart he went to all those states that uh, that had a chance of flipping so you don't decide football games by the number of yards clicked instead of the scoreboard right right he, he knew how the game was played uh, for anyone to call him stupid at this point i mean this guy had both major parties against him the republicans probably hated him more than the democrats i don't know who the call who the hell is calling me there? Okay. Uh, he had both major parties and probably 99% of the media against him and won. Nobody stupid could do that. And speaking of the media, I think it's not even an opinion to say this, that there was mass collusion by the media to get Trump to not win this election. I mean, the it's, examples all over the place. CNN's still freaking out, but they gave Clinton debate questions. Um, uh, I mean, they've been unmasked again and again and again. Uh, and I think a uh, recent study, 93% of their coverage has been negative. I don't want no. I guess I do know why they don't admit it, because then they'd lose all legitimacy. They pose as objective, but they're not at all. They break modern journalists break every rule they told me in journalism school. Case in point, even the word racism, you can't quantify that. You, I mean, it's used as nothing more than it basically means sinner these days but you can't really put an objective meaning on that it's expanded over my lifetime when i was a kid that meant you wanted to harm somebody from a different ethnic or you know continental background now it means noticing differences and let's run the logic of that um 
This idea that the Russians are bad because they tried to interfere with the election and alter the outcome. Well, I mean, wasn't that what the Washington Post and the New York Times were doing for an entire year with the Trump campaign? One thing you'll never hear is how much influence Israel has over U.S. politics. You look at the, the tape of Netanyahu speaking before Congress, 29 standing ovations. No American president got close to that. Israel fucks with American policy all the time. I think every country tries, you know, with any kind of power, tries to influence other elections. I haven't seen anything quantified what the Russians actually did. Julian Assange says that he that Russians did not uh, leak what was revealed about Podesta and, and Clinton's emails. Maybe he's a liar, but as far as I know, I've seen no proof. And what did Trump say? What would be so bad about getting along with Russia? Nothing if you want to avoid World War III. I mean, as they talk about how dangerous he is, I think Clinton would have probably started World War III. She's a raging warmonger. But if she says nice things about women and having a vagina and pats a little gay child on the head, I guess all that's forgiven. It's amazing how blind people are to what the, the bigger problems are. $20 trillion debt. That's not nearly as bad as someone casting aspersions on a minority. I think everyone's got their, their priorities upside down. And when you look at some of the media coverage heading into the election, obviously they had the Huffington Post running a disclaimer saying that Trump was a racist and a xenophobe in every article mentioning his name. There was at least one New York Times reporter who sent a death threat to Donald Trump and did not lose his job. Do you think that at the end of the day, all of this deluge of negative coverage of Trump actually worked against the media and just made people more you know, sort of empathetic with Trump? I think, what again, with this racism thing, they've kept moving the goalposts. I think most white people, you know, who knows? I, you know, I, I was born in the early 60s. I think most white people were A-OK with getting along with non-white people. They didn't expect when Obama got elected to be shit on increasingly year after year. And I think a lot of people, if they have one scrap of self-esteem, said, fuck this. And the media doesn't realize that. There's open ethnic hostility toward the dominant ethnicity in America. How anyone thinks that's a, a, a prescription for victory? How naive are they about basic human psychology? She wouldn't, I mean, deplorables and Obama called them bitter clingers, stupid. You hear that all the time. And I always get into trouble. Really? You want to talk about stupid? Because I did an article called No Brain, No Vote. You take average black IQ, white IQ, you, you take the demographic, you know, how many are Democrat. If, if you actually had to administer an IQ test to win, the Republicans would never lose an election. But they, they once, you know, they'll say stupid, stupid, stupid uh, up until you roll out the IQ test and they shut the hell up. Yeah, they, they, they don't really understand human psychology and uh, and they are so removed from these people who voted against them. I think it was Pauline Kael, the uh, film critic, it was either 68 or 72, when Nixon won and she said, I only know one person who voted for Nixon. It's like, yeah, maybe you should get out more. These people are, I mean, you look at a, I mean, if you look at the red and blue maps of geographic areas, it's almost entirely red that voted for Trump. It's only these tiny coastal towns, uh, or not tiny, but you know, tiny area wise towns that, uh, that voted blue. And I think, I mean, I've said since the Redneck Manifesto, I don't even think the big divide is racial, uh, or even class. It's, I think more than anything, it's urban versus rural. They might as well be two races. The lifestyle, the values are completely different. And, um, you know, I made, I made this point over and over again in the Redneck book. The way they describe rural people, that's classic dehumanization. You know, knuckle dragging. You know, they talk about eugenics, inbred, toothless, stupid, cousin fucking. How do you expect these people to respond if you treat them like that? How dumb do you have to be to think they're going to just obey you? Oh, you're kind of, I don't know. Oh, I'm so stupid. I don't even know what my best interests are. Thanks. Please tell me. They really think these people are going to capitulate? I guess they have for long enough, but I, th I think something really changed. They got sick of it. I think nothing will piss people off more than having their good intentions trampled on. I think so many white people really wanted to get along. They just didn't want to be demonized and have their demographic decline celebrated. Yeah, how many times, oh, you're going to die out, and it's going to be great, and there will be no wars. It's like, fuck you. It's it's a, almost equivalent to being a Jew in Germany in the 30s, being a white male right now in America. You're responsible for everything wrong, no matter how far you're removed from the levers of power. 
I mean, I, how, how many people I've had accuse me of privilege, you know, pointing a finger at me from some gated community. And I guess unless you've been through that, you don't understand how galling it is. But that's how clueless they are. They didn't understand psychology. And I kind of take a lot of glee. This Russia bullshit and uh, never race it. They really have no idea why they lost. And I think that's why they're going to continue to lose. And earlier you talked about going to the Trump campaign stop in Atlanta. I was also there doing some coverage okay. of it. And one of the things that really struck me about it, and obviously you didn't see this in the mainstream media coverage, is just how many non-white people you have there. I interviewed several black couples, interviewed no, a number of Asian immigrants. Weren't a whole lot of Hispanic people, obviously, but it wasn't, you know, the big, you know, white sausage party everyone, you know, sort of makes it out to be on CNN and CBS. So what do you think of the coverage of Trump voters themselves in the lead up to the election? What did uh, that do to perhaps sort of galvanize the Trump base? I think one, I mean, the most brilliant thing he did was at every speech he would, tell the uh, audience, hey, look back there, there's the press, they're a bunch of liars, and they would get roundly booed. And I used to think, you know, I was naive, I went to journalism school, anyone who complains about the press must be some liar or some corrupt politician who got caught. And you realize most of them really aren't journalists, they're ideologues with an agenda. What I was taught in journalism school is to treat it like a science. You don't, you don't say what Obama thinks, because you don't know. You, you can only go by what you can, you know, like a science, what you can see with your eyes, what's recorded. Even if someone's arrested, you don't say they killed anybody. You say police say they, until it's proved. Now, almost all political commentary, oh, Trump only wants to do that because he secretly wants to see people die in the streets. He only does this because he's motivated and scared. It's like, how the hell do you know? That's the problem with 99% of discourse these days It's just mind reading. Well, yeah, you might say that, but that's only because blank. And it sickens me. It's lots of, I, <laughs> I love to argue because I don't think I ever lose, but I, I hesitate to do it with a lot of people these days because they don't even know what an argument is and what uh, a character attack is. I'm great at insulting people, but I, I, I like to expand my purview beyond that. All people have is you're evil, we're the good side, and you need to die. I don't get into that sort of uh, in-group, out-group psychology. Yeah, one of my favorite Orwellian quotes uh, from the Associated Press recently was when they were doing a story against Trump, and uh, one of the lines was they quoted a source, and I quote, familiar with the president's thinking, as if that's actually an official way of getting <laughs> information out there. Familiar with the president's thinking. Uh, well, what, I mean, not only was I taught this in journalism school, in my checkered career, I've had my motives imputed so many times, and they're almost always wrong. When my magazine went on trial for obscenity in 1996, the magazine came out in 94, you had the prosecution arguing what I intended to do, and you had the defense arguing what I intended to do, and they were both wrong. And uh, that's close to an existential nightmare. I think it was Jean-Paul Sartre said the, the biggest hell for an existentialist is death because then everyone gets to define what you meant. Both of these people were arguing what I meant with the, the magazine. They were both way off. So I try not to do that. I try to just take what someone says and see if it made sense or not. What their motives are, I don't know. I don't care. I was, I'm reminded of uh, Bookman, the library cop in Seinfeld. He talks about, well, there was a, there was a time when we didn't uh, know what a librarian's personal life was. We didn't want to know what a librarian's personal life was. I don't want to know what motivates these people. I don't want to crawl inside their heads. It's probably terrifying. I just examine what they say and whether it makes sense and whether it's factual and whether it, maybe that makes me autistic or um, <laughs> cold, sociopathic. I don't see how it's a character flaw to be logical. These people aren't so much emotions behind it. And that's where people go wrong. And moralism. You know, they're only doing that because they're evil. Anytime anyone uses the word evil, I immediately put an idiot star on their on their lapel. But good I mean, I think, you know, Nietzsche I thought burst that bubble a long time ago. There's no such thing. These are these are terms of people I think these concepts came along with evolution. And it, what you I will find consistent the only thing that's consistent about good and evil, these definitions, usually something's good if it uh, furthers someone's well-being and survival. It's evil if it hurts them. It's not nearly as evil when someone gets killed halfway around the world and when their own child gets killed. I think that's the only thing that's consistent about this. 
But uh, talk about a social construct. Yeah, evil. No one knows what Trump thinks. I don't know. I only care that uh, he seems to be concerned about bringing manufacturing back here and not uh, not feeling guilty for this country. I think it was a, a giant guilt trip for eight years with Obama. Obama, Obama even, uh, I think his deadbeat dad left and he was raised entirely by white people, but, uh, and you know, his mom was white, but on the census he clicked black. He could have picked mixed race. He didn't, he was a total identity politician. And one thing I noticed, yeah, with the, the Trump speech, I challenged people to find Trump ever once in his entire career saying white people or directly appealing to, Hey, you white people. He never does it. Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, you know, they're wearing sombreros. Bernie's posing for these cheesy pictures with his big fat rapper named Killer Mike. Couldn't be more inauthentic. Bernie Sanders doesn't know a goddamn thing about black people. See, I think he's from Brooklyn, but he's lived in Vermont, which is, what, 96, 94 percent white. These people, it seems like they... uh, they worship black people because it's the thing to do and they know what the consequences are if you don't. And what that tells me is they're conformists and that they would have been Klansmen a hundred years ago or Nazis in Nazi Germany. They just go with the flow. I, I'm always amused. Well, if I, if I was in Germany, I would have killed. No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't have killed Hitler. You would have worshipped him because you're following the crowd now and you're the type of person who follows the crowd. So you would have been a Nazi back then. <laughs> And just to quickly compare and contrast how Trump supporters were depicted in contrast to Clinton supporters. Now, there was a particular program on Showtime called The Circus, which basically followed everyone around the campaign trail. And I think it was very emblematic of basically how the mainstream media just as a whole presented both sides of the supporters. To where every time they interviewed a Hillary supporter, it was very dire, like this is an important message, everything is legitimate. But then when they talked to the Trump supporters, all of a sudden it was in a very dark and sort of somber tone. You know, it was like watching Triumph of the Will. You know, everything was in slow motion and making them look like slobbering wolverines. And I see that not just there, but really across the board. There was like this almost willing refusal to let Trump supporters speak for themselves during the campaign cycle. They kept charting out what I call computer chair sociologists, saying this is why they're voting for Trump, because they've been manipulated, you know. They've had low wages. They never actually let people voting for Trump explain why they were voting for Trump. And or even if they try to explain, they don't accept <laughs> what they say. A line I keep going back to. I I was a big hip hop fan in the late '80s, and I interviewed Chuck D from Public Enemy, and I asked him. I don't. I forget what the question was, but he just sighed and he said, "You know, you tell people what you are, and they still don't believe you." I think that happened with a lot of these people, and they, you know, they're not as dumb. These rednecks and. Flyover country, they're not nearly as dumb as these people think they are. They can smell the contempt that the elites have for them. And this was a reaction to that. What bugged me the most in the coverage was uh, how they portrayed the violence. There were isolated situations. I think there was uh, some elderly white guy who punched a black dude at some Trump rally. That got blasted all over the place. But for the most part, and I would challenge people when this was happening, like, show me one incident of Trump reporters showing up to a Clinton or Sanders rally and and interrupting it and throwing shit and setting cars on fire and and attacking people. It just didn't happen. The violence was almost entirely left on right. That's not the way it was covered. Oh, he's creating a climate of violence. And uh, in ways, it reminds me of the situation I went up in prison for. I finally hit back and went to prison. Uh... And these people didn't see cause and effect. I, you know, they, they even shut up. They shut down an entire rally in, in Chicago. People are just complete assholes. Um, I've been told it comes from a Robert A. Heinlein quote, but it was in the comments of Tacky's Mag a couple of years ago. Someone said, forget about left and right, communist, fascist, libertarian, socialist. Big political divide. There's two types of people, people who want to be left alone and people who won't leave you the hell alone. And that's one of my major beefs with the modern left. Everything's political to them. They have to have their nose up everyone's ass. Um, you know, everything needs to be managed, handled, infiltrated, controlled by the government. I want to be left alone. I don't bug people. I don't harass people. They don't uh, grant me the same, the same courtesy, though. A lot of, I mean, 
I was friends with uh, this punk rock singer for for years, and he could just never shut up with the uh, the politics. We didn't agree on anything, but I was at least nice enough. You know, if we're going out to dinner, talk about the dinner. Don't oh, you know, you you're only you only enjoy that kale salad because the Koch brothers. It's like after a while, it's like okay, shut up. Like I remember this guy. He was staying here like a year ago. His, his band was playing Atlanta. He gets out of the shower. He's got a towel on, and he starts railing about the Koch brothers. I'm like, will you shut the fuck up? They just, uh, everything, you know, that, that's one thing, uh, one of the reasons I got alienated from leftism pretty early on, like late teens, early twenties, where everything had to be political. You couldn't just have a fun song. You had to be punching up and taking down the power. It's like, why enjoy your life? I really want to go back to a world where you can just enjoy things. That's nothing to do with politics. That world seems to be gone. And I, I think probably it's a, a matter of shifting demographics. We're at, uh, you know, tectonic plates are moving. Things are changing rapidly. So I guess for now, everything has to be political until the dust settles. I hate that. Um, lost a bunch of friends over this. People who turned uh, SJW in ways I never expected them to. People who seem to get it but are now talking about rape culture and sexism. It's like, wow. I'm, it's just really disappointing because it's almost like body snatchers. Like They got you. I'm sure some people think that about me. Oh, he's he's on the right now. And I never, ever claim to be on the right. I'm just uh, relentlessly critical of leftism because that's the dominant cultural paradigm. Uh, you pretty you can't get fired for. Uh, how, how do I put this? You can't get fired for being gay, but you can get your business taken away for refusing to bake a gay wedding cake. It's clear where the cultural power is and who are the silenced. And it's a complete mirror image of what it was 50, 60 years ago. Problem with the modern left is they're still fighting like this old script. They really think wasps run the show and are ones in power. No, nah, no. Nah. You could pretty much say anything you want to about white Christians and not only not get fired, you'll get promoted. But you touch any liberal sacred cow, they will destroy you. And that's my problem. I don't like fanatics, and I don't like ideologues. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out how white privilege works when Asians and Jews each make 20000 more per year than the average Caucasian household, but that's just the, the side. The last, uh, I mean, the last hierarchy I saw was Indians, the highest per capita, and Jews and Asians. And here's a topic that's red hot that you can never mention without being branded with all sorts of nasty names, but... An ethnic group's per capita income is pretty tightly correlated to their per capita IQ. Uh, you know, I get called a white supremacist. I don't think that's possible when I look at the IQ test and see East Asians and Jews and Indians doing better than whites. Uh, I, I don't. <laughs> how? How is it? I mean, white people can't even have white student unions, but every other group can. How the hell does that work if it's a white privilege, you know, a white supremacist system? Uh, the, again, these people, they think they're on the cutting edge and they think they're on the right side of history. They're fighting really old wars. They'll still mention Emmett Till. And when did Emmett Till get killed? It was like the early 50s. They won't dare mention modern interracial violence or interracial rape rates because that would subvert their entire gospel. And you get, you get ostracized for even mentioning it. And, and I've said this before, but oh, I don't want to live in a country where Muslims have to be afraid. I don't want to live in a country where people have to be afraid of speaking their minds because they might get destroyed over it. I've never heard an idea from anyone else where I wanted to just kill that person. Might not want to hang out with them, but was never even, oh, you know, I disagree with you and here's why. Prove me wrong. I'll do that. But even the desire, I'm going to destroy your life. I'm going to get you fired. No, no. That's a totalitarian. And uh, <laughs> I mean, and, and just the, uh, the the way they move the goalpost, if you disagree with them, you're a fascist, you're a Nazi. It's like, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm not calling for anyone that disagrees with me to be jailed or destroyed. I, I think uh, you might be the totalitarians in this equation. And these people have no knowledge of history. You know, you know, oh, read a book. It's like, bitch, I've written seven of them. I don't want to hear about read a book, read, read a book about communism. Read a book about the death tolls of communism compared to fascism, but you can't you can't mention any of that because they will question your motives. It was uh, Hannah Arendt, A R E N D T. I think she attended the Nuremberg trials. She wrote a book called The Origins of Totalitarianism. She said the great success of the totalitarian regimes of the early 20th century, whether fascist or communist, 
was they could take any statement of fact and turn it into a question of motive. They wouldn't even bother to say, well, that's true or that's false. It's like, why are you saying that? You're only saying that because you're filled with hate. And, and once you start seeing that, you see it everywhere. Like when I did the Redneck book, I started attuning myself to anti-poor white stereotypes. Suddenly, you see them everywhere. And that's what I see in all this discourse. Like, no, you're only saying that because you're evil. At that point, you know, I check out. It's like, well, you're dumb. <laughs> you, you don't know how to argue. Uh, you're just you're just trying to infect me with, with evil. And so you're the good person. You can step on my head and justify anything that happens to me. I don't play that game. I, I'm slowly developing this philosophy. I think moralists tend to be the most unethical people on earth. All the really great human beings I've known never, ever feel the need to make a point of how good they are. They just go about it silently because they think it's the right thing to do. Well, like in pathological altruism. There's a lot of pathological altruism, too. Uh, I, I don't understand what people think the end game of, of just endless white guilt is. I, I think some of them really think that's a good thing. White, you know, the whites will be bred out of existence or treated as poorly as they claim all whites treated non-whites. I mean, most... You know, they talk, oh, well, you, know, you didn't do anything to stop it. Well, I don't see many black people doing anything to stop rampant black on white violence. What's their motivation for? That, I mean, uh, unless they're actually perpetrating it, like, they, uh, I mean, they benefit on society, from society's current societal morality dictates that blacks are pretty much blameless and anything they do wrong is because of what happened to them in the past i don't see that i see blacks and women and gays as human beings meaning they can all be assholes um you know i don't think uh i mean i i'm pretty sure i think everyone would acknowledge there are physical differences between ethnic groups uh you watch the nba i think that becomes pretty obvious not a lot of uh koreans playing I also think it's pretty clear there are average cognitive dif differences. doesn't mean there aren't black geniuses. Statistically, it's more rare. Uh, the one frontier I haven't explored, I'm not even sure I'm going to bother to, is whether there are character differences between different groups. I, I would like to think not. But right now, um, everyone's equal except white people are uniquely evil. That's not a recipe for harmony. That's a recipe for conflict. And I wonder if that's intentional. It's funny. People don't, people will watch every movie you go see. There's some evil villain plotting and conspiring. People believe that all the time in the movies. They don't believe that possibly happens in real life. There have been proven conspiracies throughout history. I even read, I wish I could find uh, the source. I read that the CIA put some money behind popularizing and maligning the term conspiracy theorist just to make it like they're all nuts. And a lot of them are. I mean, a lot, a lot of schizophrenics who get radio transmissions and their tooth fillings and hear voices. But, uh, I mean, someone like Alex Jones, uh, he'll, he'll dress globalism and, and things that the other media won't, but then all of a sudden he'll take his shirt off and cry. I almost think he's sort of controlled opposition. Well, you make the connection, here's a, here's a guy who acts like a lunatic half the time, but he brings up the idea that maybe the powerful and the wealthy do conspire. Well, then you make that connection in your head. Well, that's crazy because he acts crazy. But there, there are plenty of people who, I mean, you have to be really gullible to think that the powerful don't, don't work together to, to maintain power. And if it's a choice between being naive and paranoid, I'll, I'll be paranoid. That's fine. <laughs> I really, really hate to appropriate leftist culture, but there's a term they use called dog whistles. And when I hear the term uneducated voters being used by the media, I think that is most certainly a dog whistle of sorts against a certain type of Trump supporter. Now, my question is, when the media use the term low education or low information voter, why is it they only use it to describe Republican voters and never poor, uneducated Democrat voters who actually, if you look at the stats, by and large are less educated than Republican voters. There's this, uh, and I hope it evaporates, there's just this general prohibition on ever blaming non-whites for anything. I mean, if you really want to get into it, in IQ scores and education levels, there are a hell of a lot of dumb black voters. That's undeniable. I mean, if you actually want to measure it, and IQ is the best best way we have to measure it, a lot of incredibly dumb black voters and who vote 
almost strictly according to race. What was it? Ninety six percent voted for Obama. Hey, you know, if 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 I had grown up in those circumstances and I lived in a country where someone who looked like me had never been, I, I would have voted. But like to deny that's racial pride or, you know, voting with your skin, it obviously is. But it's something that only white people will get blamed for again. And uh, maybe they shouldn't have raised me Catholic because I get really honed in on guilt and guilt projection and moralists being wretched and violent and mean and cruel, but doing it in the name of good. So I'm really highly attuned to a lot of this stuff. Um, but it's hilarious. I mean, you look at, uh, what was it, uh, Hillary Clinton? There was some some black music artist. I don't know if it was a hip-hop guy or not, but she's on Ellen trying to trying to dance or twerk. And it's just so pathetically inauthentic. Um, one thing I noticed about Trump, and I did an article about this, I found 77 hip-hop lyrics praising him to high heavens. Rappers loved Donald Trump until he ran for president. They just saw this guy who had balls, who was unapologetic, and was a pimp who just raked in cash. And that's what most most rappers were all about. Um, I, you know, even, uh, what was it, proposition, it was a proposition uh, for anti-gay marriage proposition in California. People who killed, uh, who, who actually passed that were black voters. They voted like against gay marriage like 15% more than whites did. And there were reports in West Hollywood of gays running around screaming, nigger, nigger, you get out of West Hollywood. And, uh, but that, that wasn't covered in the press. And I, I think uh, what will be the undoing of the left is it's a shaky coalition to begin with. And even they kind of tacitly acknowledge that in this concept of intersectionality that well, you know, or the progressive stack like they had at Occupy. To be the first speaker, you basically had to be the one-armed lesbian black midget with cancer to go first. You know, you were the most oppressed. And it's weird. I, I think, you know, there, there was a time a long time ago where if you were the historical loser, that was not a bragging right. That was something to be ashamed of. And I, I talk about, I mean, most of my ancestry is English. That little soggy island with no natural resources once ruled the world. And then they decided to feel guilty about it. I don't know. I, don't, <laughs> I would much rather. I was watching uh, Rod Serling's Night Gallery a couple nights ago. And there's an episode called The Caterpillar. And it's these, these British colonists in Borneo. And the guy falls in love with the, the young hot wife of this elderly man. And conspires to get an earwig put in the guy's ear to eat his brains out. And, but you look at the dignity of these people, and uh, I think that's a lot more admirable than these self-flagellating, Islam-worshipping, self-hating Brits you have these days. I, I don't think there's even a comparison. But even to say these things, you suddenly become a white supremacist or a Nazi or fascist who wants to kill all these people. And if I say I don't want to, they'll just say I'm in denial. Because they obviously they know my intentions better than I do. I mean, uh, self hatred is not attractive in any group. Black people got more likable when they started getting an attitude <laughs> and having pride. Uh, it, that's much more likable than yes, master, I'm coming. Oh, feet don't fail me now. Like yeah, self respect is admirable. And when I was in prison, it was amazing because they they move you around all the time. So they put you in with you know different cellmates every month. Bunch of black cellmates. Every one of them, without even being asked, uh, the only white guys I admire in here are Nazis. Well, really? Why is that? Well, they'll stab you in the stomach rather than the back. Their their assumption was that everyone's tribal, and at least the Nazis were honest about it. <laughs> Speaking of uh, tribalism, the whole intersectional pyramid you're talking about earlier didn't end up working for Hillary. So why didn't the minority support come in uh, for Hillary the way it did Obama? A couple. Th I mean, I just don't think uh, she's got that groove. She really is not a soulful <laughs> or ri very rhythmic person. But I think what haunted her was, uh, and I did a whole article about this. What the, what the hell did she go? Super predators. When Bill Clinton passed the, this crime bill, apparently it led to huge numbers of blacks being incarcerated. And uh, what I found somewhat comical about it was she never mentioned black. She just said there are people that are super predators and they need to be taken off the streets. 
And black people said, well, she's talking about us. It's like, well, she didn't say that, but <laughs> if the shoe fits, I guess. But uh, she was just not really. I mean, they loved Bill Clinton. There was just something they I think, you know, speculating. I can't read minds, but it seems as if she was talking down to them. And a lot of them felt that way. And, and as far as I know, they didn't show up in nearly the numbers they did to elect Obama twice. All right. And getting back to it. One of the interesting things about the outcome of the election that no one really talks about is the minority turnout for Trump, because we had 40 percent of female voters voted for Trump. And what's really striking about that is the only demographic for white females that actually voted for Hillary was 18 to 25. Everyone older than that, majority voted for Trump. Uh, We also had one third of Asians voted for Trump, one third of Hispanics in America voted for Trump, and one out of 10 black people in America voted for Trump. So why is it the media has never put the spotlight on them to get their opinion on why this guy was elected? Well, the the surprising thing to me was the third of Hispanics, because you think if there was one group who wouldn't like him, uh, because I I can't, I don't know why there's such black hatred for Trump. They were the one, they almost voted against him in numbers like similar to how they voted for Obama. Uh, But he wasn't talking about building a wall around the ghetto. He was talking about building on the, the southern border. Perhaps a lot of Hispanics are ones who came here legally and really resent the stigma that the illegals are giving them. Um, I, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm going to be doing a podcast soon. One of the first people I want to interview is uh, Uncle Hotep. There's a group of blacks called the Hoteps. They're pretty much like the black alt-right. They think the Democrats are full of shit. They condescend to blacks. That the black Most of the black community's problems, they say, are caused by blacks. And they need to stop blaming white people and just get it together. And who knows? Um, who was <laughs> a friend from North Carolina told me. He had a black friend or somebody. He's like, they said, you know, Donald Trump is the realest nigga in this race. I think that's his appeal to a lot of people. He's just, he doesn't have that varnish. He doesn't have that mannequin like quality that so many of these other people did. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons Bernie Sanders uh, appealed to so many people. They talk about Trump being angry. Jesus Christ. Have you ever seen Bernie Sanders speak? The guy's going to have a stroke at any time. That guy's furious. But I guess since it was for the right causes, you know, in these, in their eyes, there's nothing wrong with that kind of anger. But, uh, I, w- I would speculate, and again, not a mind reader. I, th- I think that some black people. So this guy's he he talks like I do. He just doesn't he doesn't care who's trying to shame him. Uh, it just doesn't matter. He's not easily cowed like that. You, you see some of these uh, who they have Rubio and Jeb Bush. These guys were robots, bl- bloodless like Clinton. I, I really, you know, I think uh, if the Democrats focused on workers and not on this, this insane identity politics, I don't think they'd have any trouble winning again and again. And when I was a kid, they were the workers party. Uh, but they're not anymore. A lot of their policies, I think Bill Clinton pushed NAFTA. They left a lot of the working class high and dry. And I think even during the Obama year, statistically, blacks did worse. Unemployment rose, income, household income dropped. Those are the things people really care about. I mean, you got to be a moron if you just want to vote for somebody because they make you feel good. But unfortunately, I think that's why a lot of people vote. And I think charisma is what wins elections. John McCain and Mitt Romney had no charisma. Obama did. I think Obama lost a lot of it. I don't know. <laughs> Bill, Bill Hicks, the comedian, he did this bit about how they'll take every presidential candidate. Once they're elected, they'll take them to a room, show them the full Zapruder film of Kennedy getting killed. And it's like, all right, any questions? Like, you fuck with us, we're going to blow your head off. It almost seemed like that happened to Obama. He was this rousing speaker. Everyone had high hopes. You know, a lot of people had high hopes for him. And anybody who tries to say that the Republican or white reaction to Obama was anywhere near the hysteria, the anti-Trump hysteria, is either dumb or lying. But something happened. Obama lost a lot of charisma. But uh, Trump, (laughs) whether you like him or hate him, he inspires Uh, strong emotions. I don't think, you know, I think some people hate Hillary Clinton, but I don't think they can be bothered to hate her as much as the people who hate Trump do. But I don't think anyone was as enthusiastic about her as the the people who really love Trump were. And shifting gears to one of my favorite ethnic groups, the Russians, uh, (laughs) one of the big logical gaps that I've observed over the last six months, the media is still hammering away at the whole Russian collusion story. Okay, See if there is sort of a logical fallacy being committed here. 
Clinton campaign keeps saying that the Russian hack is what cost them the election. But here's a question. Why did it cost them the election? Is it because the Russians hacked it or because the information the Russians exposed showed that well, he was corrupt and the exactly. like court found that out? That, but that's what I mean. There's this absolute void of self-reflection. Like, you don't hear any of them saying, we did something wrong. And I suspect that's why they're going to keep losing. Blaming it on Russia. I've, you talk about a nothing burger. I've seen nothing. Nothing that even remotely suggests. And, and again, I, I, whether it's right or wrong, Saudi Arabia doesn't meddle in our electoral process. Israel? I, there are probably you know five or ten countries that try to mess with it more and more successfully than Russia ever did, even if they did. But I don't. I when Trump said you know who it would be valuable to have Putin as an ally to fight radical Islam, I think Putin's hated because he uh, he's not a globalist; he's a nationalist, and I think that's at the root of it. Trump really shook the foundations of power. Uh, he. He came in and reset the whole chessboard, and I think that's why they're freaking out. Plus, there was, I mean, leftist, leftism, at least in its latter-day incarnations, operates much more like a religion than it does an ideology. These people really think they are the good people. And when someone comes along and kind of smashes that idea, you're going to call him Satan. <laughs> and that, that's what's happening. I... <laughs> The only thing he's done so far that really uh, disappointed me was bombing Syria because I went against everything that he promised to do. He, he said many times we have no business being anywhere in the Middle East. And uh, I guess, you know, the neocon earwig got in his ear. Otherwise, he's tried to do everything he said he was going to do. And uh, I like that he tweets and insults people. I'd much rather see that than someone because... Uh, you can imagine what Clinton said about, and there was a book that came out. Who knows whether, whether it's true or not? That uh, it was somebody who's an ex-Clinton associate. The way she talked about blacks and Jews was far beyond anything that's ever been attributed to Donald Trump. Whether it's true or not, I, I would tend to believe it. She just doesn't seem like a very uh, compassionate person, and I don't think it was because she was a woman. It's because everyone knows a woman like her. <laughs> and I think that's why she lost because people don't like that type of woman. It has nothing to do with. With you know she's strong or accomplished, it, she's sadistic and power hungry and uh, lacking compassion. You know, there's been so much you know armchair sociology work going in about the results of the election, but I think to me, <laughs> once you strip away you know all the racism and the sexism and the identity politics, I think there's a very simple reason why Trump won and Hillary didn't. I don't see if you agree with me. This election, the past one, was about globalism versus economic nationalism. And this time, economic nationalism won. Would you say that's the big overarching story of Trump's election? That and uh, cultural Marxism versus irreverence. <laughs> he, uh, he just didn't bow to any of that stuff. And like I said, you know, it depends on where you are in the historical cycle. Uh, he would have been a dick in the 60s. He would have been the asshole because, yeah, I mean, uh, there was tons of black suffering. Uh, and, I mean, I, I, you know, I grew up in Philly. Cops there would just knock black heads in with nightclub, just look for them to beat up. That's not the case anymore. And, uh, like I said, there are a lot of white people. The left has almost become a Nazi factory. With You constantly bash white people. You're going to create Nazis. You're not going to create anti-racism. You're going to create a defensive wave, and that's what's happened. I think on one level, you might look at it as unfortunate, but I think it's just natural. You can't shit. I mean, maybe wait till they're a minority to start shitting on them because <laughs> it's dangerous to, to demonize. Because, yeah, uh, again, you know, using the Nazi Germany, Jews were a tiny minority. This is like making the Germans the Jews in Germany might not turn out as well as you expected. These people, I think most of these people were, were, I mean, I know I used to be a liberal. I was fine getting rid of my identity, you know, not taking any pride. And I still don't take pride. I just don't take shame. I accepted this guilt trip for things I had no power over. And, you know, every chance I had to be nice to non-whites, I was, I mean, I, I take them on an individual basis. If somebody's addicted to me, I'm not going to be nice, but it's never a problem being polite to people 
But again, like when you take their good intentions, like, no, you're still evil. And actually, you're more evil than when you voted for Obama. Sooner or later, people are going to say, all right, fuck you and stand up for themselves. And I respect that. And like I said, in anyone, black people are much more likable now that they're not shuffling and apologizing. I, I you know, it's naive. I, I think it's, uh, it's fatally naive to think people are ever going to get beyond tribal identity. But to me, that was the deal as it was pitched in the 60s. It's like when the old, we all need to just get along and harmonize. One thing that alienated me was the minute they're telling white people to just shut the hell up about being white. It's like, okay, La Raza, okay, Black Pride, okay, you know, all these other total supremacist ideologies were were encouraged. That's when I started thinking, all right, something else is going on here. This is not about this is not a prescription for harmony. This is a prescription for conflict, and that's what they're getting. And throughout the election cycle, I remember just watching Trump's campaign ads, and you're seeing less mentions about infrastructure development and increasing domestic manufacturing, and then the Clinton ad would come on and it was about teenage girls' body image issues. And I'm wondering if the results of this election kind of prove once and for all that identity politics isn't really a winnable driving force in actual politics. I think it is if you're appealing to the majority. I think where they went wrong is they practiced <laughs> identity politics exclusively among minorities. And until collectively the minorities are the majority, it's going to be a losing, losing game. And, uh, but again, like with intersectionality, you're going to have black and Hispanic resentment. Uh, back when I listened to hip hop, I mean, there, there was a, there was a group from uh, Houston called the terrorists and they were complaining about all these Vietnamese and Mexican immigrants. And that, that's a story that doesn't get reported. Um, Hispanic on black violence. My God, they're doing ethnic cleansing across the country. The LA Times did an article about it, and I think it was guest written by Sheriff Lee Baca, who was a, a Hispanic, I think he might have been LA County Sheriff. But he said, you have groups of Hispanics that will just pick black people at random, kill them. And these aren't gang members, they're just killing them because they're black. And you don't see that reported because I think it severely subverts this idea that, you know, if it was just wasn't for white racism, everyone would get along. Well, look at history. People don't tend to get along, especially if they have fundamental differences. I, I've said it many times, uh, leftists understand divorce. They're totally pro-divorce. Why? Well, because some people are just not compatible. And sooner or later, they're not going to be able to get along. It's better to just separate but they, uh, they don't take that on a macro scale. Well, what about cultures and ethnicities and races and religions that are incompatible? You really think you're going to cram everyone together and there's going to be harmony? That's so naive. It's, it would be funny if it wasn't uh, dangerous. Yeah, and while the mainstream media is still pushing for you know, diversity uberalls, you know, will there ever come a point when the media will acknowledge that things like reducing the debt and restricting unlawful immigration or even restricting outsourcing are valid political concerns among the electorate? I, I mean, what's the, uh, what's the cloward Piven plan? Uh, I may be getting their names wrong, but this was a scheme basically just bankrupt the, uh, the nation until you can get like complete state control of everything. Who knows if that has anything to do with it? Cause I've said many times, really like whether someone uses the proper bathrooms really more important than a $20 trillion debt. There are plenty of scary things on the internet. To me, the scariest thing is you go to the U.S. debt clock. And last I checked, and this was like a couple of years ago, the average taxpayer, and that's me, I'm a taxpayer. I go, I mostly freelance, and I go in at the end of the year, I owe Uncle Sam 10, 12,000 bucks every year. Average taxpayer owes a million dollars. That's robbery. That's, that's, I think, worse than many forms of indentured servitude. I, you know, Trump was the only guy I ever voted for that won. I really haven't approved any of these, these <laughs> laws that, that bleed my money out of me until, what is it, was the average taxpayer work until late April every year just to pay off the government and then they start making money for themselves? Uh, to me, that's much more, and I think, I think the problem, that I think the debt's too big. I think there will be an economic collapse, no matter if you have a... A successful businessman. Uh, I think it's just a matter of time, and I I really think that's when the conflict's going to come. I wish I hope more than anything that I'm wrong about that, but I think mathematically it's inevitable. You know, I have to disagree. I still think transgender bathrooms at Target are more important than the collapse of civilization as we know it. There you go. As long as they, you know, they're not uh, microaggressed upon, 
That's that's such. I mean, so so many of these comical notions, microaggressions. Go to Somalia, see if anyone worries about microaggressions, where you know they have to beat flies off of them to go find a a piece of cow dung that has enough nutrition to maybe get them by another week. Uh, it's uh, I think I'll keep thinking of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The psychologist, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. He sort of had a pyramidal structure of human needs. At the bottom was shelter, food, you know, and then when you get up, then you can worry about friends and you know, up at the top, self actualization. Microaggressions are the very point, tip top of that pyramid. If you're hungry, you're not going to worry about microaggressions. A lot of people will slit their neighbor's throat if they're that hungry. And I hope it doesn't come to that, but uh, I'd like to see an example of a, a nation this diverse that lasted. Uh, and I'm not one for conformity or joining groups, but groups of individuals tend to operate better when they're somewhat on the same page. And we don't have that anymore in this country at all. And I, uh, I don't know. We don't know anyone who's optimistic. I, I mean, it, to me, it was a tremendous relief when he got elected just because of... Uh, the motions these assholes have put me through over my life just for thinking differently. I've lost jobs. I've, I, my magazine went on an obscenity trial. Uh, stalked on the streets by anti-racist skinheads because they thought I was a Nazi. Wouldn't, wouldn't talk to me about it. They just you know, tagged me as one, you know, attacked me. I hope that at least culturally it, uh, it represented the end of a lot of that shit. All the witch hunting and uh, shit that was just as... Uh, Repressive. I don't want the term oppressive. Just as uh, unpleasant and moralistic as anything I grew up with as a kid. When I was a kid, you know, it was communists and sex that were the things you couldn't endorse, or you know, inter anything interracial, anything pro woman. Like th those were all forbidden. And instead of just getting rid of that stupid script, they just flipped it. You know, now th what were considered the biggest perverts, gays and trannies, they're godlike now. You can't touch them. You know, blacks were considered subhuman. Now they're they're sacred. How about you just get rid of that whole way of thinking that these are good guys and these are bad guys and say, ah, you know, pretty much, I want to say 90% of you are assholes. 10% <laughs> 10, 10 of you I might be able to get along with and it generally has very little to do with your skin color or even your ideology. Unless your ideology, like I said, is meddlesome or you can't even be a friend without bringing the shit up or you know, beating me over the head with it. And you think there's any other major factors for why Trump won that we haven't spoken about? I know Obamacare and the ongoing assault on free speech are two big ones, which are probably big enough for their entire shows. But anything else yeah. you want to quickly touch upon? I mean, that's that's what I see with the things he talked about. We're outsourcing, uh, you know, these wars, these Middle Eastern wars. Pretty, they're going to bankrupt the country. What do we get out of it? Um, as far as I can tell, we're pretty much Israel's proxy fighting force. I don't think the U.S. has any business there. Uh, there's plenty of oil here if that's what you want. Um, I mean, if there is a warlike situation, a classic situation that requires troops, it's the porous southern border. That's an invasion. You know, that's how, how was the U.S. conquered? Well, the Indians, or whatever you want to call them, they fought hard. They were just swarmed with numbers. Um... Uh, that's how Ireland was conquered. They were, you know, the fighting Irish. They were brutal fighters. They had heart. They just sent over enough Scots that they squat. They they overwhelmed them with numbers. And anyone who thinks that's not what's happening, you see these people. Oh, you're paranoid. Oh yeah, ooh, white genocide. At the same t five minutes later, but yeah, and I can't wait till they die out and it'll be the last gasp of this corrupt evil. Well, you can't have it both ways. It's either happening and you're some sadist taking pleasure in it, or it's not happening. But you can't, they, they act like they're not bound by the rules of logic, and I guess that's the problem. Like You'll always lose the debate by, to a stupid person or an illogical person because they don't have to play by the rules. They, they just say whatever makes them feel good. Um, <laughs> I mean, I see these, you know, these oh, white people saying white people need to die out. It's like... Try being a black person saying that kind of shit in, in the black hood. You get curb stomped. Uh, you say that white, you get, you get a promotion. That, that's, there's something wrong with white people these days. And I think a lot of it is propaganda. They've been brainwashed into self-hatred. I, you know, I, I don't think uh, that's a winning strategy. Maybe, and maybe they are. I mean, so few people my age 
you know, I'm in my fifties. I don't know many friends that have kids. There's a, there's a suicidal impulse, I think, uh, among a lot of white people. Maybe it's just, you know, it's history cyclical. They got fat and, and comfortable and people who were hungry came up and, uh, tried to take it and probably will if they don't fight back. Um, you know, many historical examples of this happening. I just don't, uh, I think <laughs> I would hope that the, the white self hatred thing abates a little bit. It doesn't have to be white pride and, and not that that offends me. I just don't, uh, I like to take credit for what I've done or haven't done and, uh, let everyone else sink or swim. But I'm, uh, I've said many times the problem with being an individual is you wind up outnumbered. <laughs> yeah, and just uh, moving ahead to, to 2020, are you still on the Trump train? I know a lot of people kind of backed out of the whole Syrian deal, but what do you do to win you back over if he has? Uh, you know, get some of these. I, I Healthcare is such a complicated topic that I, I just don't comment on it. I don't know enough about it. Uh, I think people vote for whatever will help them. I've got pre-existing conditions. I had a brain tumor 10 years ago. I'm for anything that keeps me alive. You know, I think most people are motivated by self-interest, no matter how much they claim to be motivated by social compassion. If, if anything, it's like self-interest. Look, I'm a good person. I'm socially motivated. I, I So it's something I don't talk about. I don't understand healthcare or how it works or what would work. I probably have to talk, take 10 doctors I respect and get their opinions. So I, I really don't have opinions on that. I, what I do know is that, uh, what Obama promised didn't happen. Premiums went up. Not everyone who was promised, you know, insurance got it. Um, so, I, you know, I, I'm agnostic about that. I, I really don't know. I, uh, I'd i like one day for there to be a semblance of an impartial media. I used to think there was, but you look back, uh, the New York Times, Walter Durante won a Pulitzer Prize for basically... Oh, hello to more. Yeah, denying that Ukrainians were starving and it's kind of a bitter pill for somebody who naively went to journalism school and know these are, you know, fighting truth to power. And these people have been liars for a long time and they, they'll just say whatever who pays them wants them to say. That's depressing. I like the idea of like the internet's great because uh, I've said many times the analogy I've used is whereas you'd only get information from a couple sources 20, 30 years ago. Now it's like a hologram. You take any topic and you've got a million laser beams coming from every direction and if you have some discretion, an image will form of the truth. You can figure out what's going with any story if you get enough sources. I love that. I, I like that the media is being wrangled out of the hands of a few. That's great. Would never want to uh, deny anyone's right to say anything. I've never been that terrified of an idea to want to shut down that person for expressing it. Uh, so that, I mean, if, if uh, this pious witch hunting insane because it feeds on itself it gets worse and worse and more and more insane if that crumbles i think you know well <laughs> i'll be happy but who knows if the economy crumbles all bets are off i i like to be wrong about the debt eventually imploding everything and destroying everything um my, as someone who's not sanctimonious, I'd like to really see everyone take the fucking sanctimony down about 40 notches. Um, and the virtue signaling and the chest beating and we're the good guys, you're the bad guys. That's what's wrong with humanity. That's what's always been wrong with humanity. No one in history has ever committed atrocities thinking they were the bad guy. Most dangerous people are those who are convinced beyond any wisp of a doubt that they're on the side of good. Those are the people who kill in the millions. What are your thoughts on the impeachment efforts? Do you think uh, Trump's going to be president <laughs> in 2020? Uh, still be president? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, it, it's funny, too, because uh, one of the, fir the first article I did for Tacky's Mag was about uh, Alvin Green, who ran for, I think, the Senate in South Carolina back in 2010. And this guy was clearly mentally disabled. You looked at his ads and it's like, this is pretty much like a retarded guy. And uh, and this was back when oh Sarah Palin no one's dumber than you know how, how what kind of an idiot and Sarah Palin's definitely not gonna be invited to Mensa. But you have I mean Hank Johnson here in Atlanta, oh Guam, who thought that the island of Guam could capsize, 
You have Sheila Jackson Lee in Texas saying that uh, she wished uh, she said something about Neil Armstrong planting a flag on Mars and that the hurricane names are too lily white. You have a lot of black. I don't know who was it? The one uh, Corinne Brown in uh, Florida. She just was indicted on a bunch of things. But there's uh, you can look it up. Corinne's CEO. I think two R's, two N's. Corinne Brown. Graduate the Gators. Or just look Corinne Brown Gators. She's up there in Congress congratulating the uh, the Florida Gators for winning the national championship. You can't understand every second word. She's just so rampagingly dumb. But. Currently, you can't say that because she's black, because that would be racist. Uh, it's like, well, no, she's dumb. That has nothing to do with being black. Or, you know, I guess if you read the bell curve, it might have a little to do with it. But uh, they're, they're brilliant black people. You got a lot of dumb. I mean, Maxine Waters, screamingly stupid, achingly, painful. My, I could pluck my eyeballs out. She's so fucking dumb. And, and Putin, Putin invaded Korea. And he's a scumbag. It's like she's been voted most corrupt person in Congress, what, three, four times? The poverty pimp. Um, she's with the biggest mouth calling for impeachment. And, you know, they, uh, they, they did it with Nixon. Um, they, they were relentless. And I know that uh, the Republicans were with Clinton, too. Clinton lied, though. <laughs> so did Nixon. I... I uh, I'm unaware of any real egregious lies Trump has told. Because, I mean, to accuse someone of lying, you have to know that they know the truth. So, I mean, nothing's come out. As far as I know, yes, Clinton did have a, an affair with Monica Lewinsky and lied about it. Yeah, the cum stains on her dress prove that. And he said, I'd never had sexual relations. Well, your cum's on her dress. Nixon denied knowledge of uh, Watergate. And it was pretty clear that he was involved in covering it up. I don't see anything he's done that's impeachable. What? He said, you know, Vladimir Putin called me brilliant, and that's great. We should get along with Russia. That's it. That's what they're going on. Or then again, like, so what if Russia was the one who found these emails? It was what's in the emails that fucked Clinton over, not the fact that Russia found it. And uh, it's funny, these people, <laughs> these same people who when the, the Holodomor was was occurring, oh, nothing wrong with Russia. When people were being injected with psychiatric drugs just for being political dissidents, when they'd be worked to death in gulags and the tens of millions, you know, shot in the back of the head or beaten in public streets. Oh, you're paranoid. Oh, the Red Scare. Ooh. When Russia was an actual danger and nuclear war was imminent, they'd gaslight you for saying there was anything wrong with Russia. What's the most they can come up with now? Oh, he, uh, he passed some law saying you shouldn't teach homosexuality to children. Now, whether or not you know you have a problem with that, I don't think that's nearly as uh, as ominous. You know, when McCarthy died, and the, and when the Soviet Union fell, and the archives were open, to my knowledge, he was proved right about many of his allegations that they were actively trying to infiltrate the U.S. government. But you mentioned oh, red skew, paranoid. One of the things that burns my ass more than anything is gaslighting. I mean, my parents did it to me. Uh, I think it's one of the cruelest things you can do to a person. No, you're crazy. When the person's, you know, sincerely looking, well, I, I think this happened. And actually, well, you know, this, I know it happened. I know you hit me. Nah, you're nuts. You're making it all up. I'd really like to see what they see as this ominous danger that uh, that Putin presents. They're, they're upset that he invaded Crimea, but they don't seem to have a problem with Hillary Clinton destabilizing Lib Libya or starting this refugee, any of that shit. I mean, I think when you put them side by side, I can't see what Putin's done that's been worse than that. Except, uh, who was a journalist that got dosed with radiation? That's creepy. <laughs> and, I mean, I, I, apparently uh, his alleged personal wealth is like 20 times what Donald Trump's is. As far as them being a danger to us, I don't see how. Well, I mean, go back to 2012 when Barack Obama, you know, did during the debate with Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney said Russia was our greatest threat, and he said, well, now he's going to yeah. public policy back. That's what, uh, what confounds and infuriates me about these people, the cognitive dissonance. They can hold two contradictory ideas and not see any contradiction. And I envy it in a way because I'm shackled and enslaved by logic and logical consistency. Yeah, they, he was mocked for saying Russia was a big threat. Now, suddenly, because they think that, you know, Putin directed the email leaks, they're the biggest threat to, to our freedom. I don't see it. 
Uh, I mean, somebody I saw online, well, you know, why do these conservatives, they used to hate Russia, now they love it. It's like, well, because it used to be communist, and now it's not. There's your answer. But they don't, you know, why do you guys, why did you not see a threat when they were an actual threat, and now they're the biggest threat when I don't see it? Guys, and I think most people do what they're, they do what they're told. They pick a team, and they take whatever the team captain tells them to believe. Then there are very few free thinkers out there, which is depressing. I'd rather, I'd rather break up that whole system. And I think, uh, I think a huge problem with the two party system is it really plays into tribalism and in group out group. We're the good guys, they're the bad guys. I'd rather have a European system where there's like 90 parties and then they have to scrape together to form a coalition. And I think that would be better. I think it, uh, left, left, right. I mean, you talk about conspiracy theory. You can, you can't find political left and right on a compass. They don't really exist. It was Robert Anton Wilson, the psychedelic philosopher who said that all a liberal has to do to become a conservative is wait 20 years without changing a single idea. They keep moving the goalpost on what's left and right. And uh, you look at what were considered progressives 100 years ago. They were all for eugenics, which is you know considered Nazi now. So these are – I guess I get frustrated when people act as if these are real things. I, I did a, a – I took like 12 of these different where do you stand political tests and uh, I scored all over the place. And I'm glad that I did because – I, I, one thing I'd like people to get beyond is this left-right bullshit. That's, that's the most transparently fraudulent conspiracy theory there is. It's based on seating in the old French legislature. And I'm not going to base my life on anything French. <laughs> that is a very good call. <laughs> yeah. Oops, my brother was mur- murdered in Paris, and they just sent his body back in a wooden casket without him bombing him. So I'm, I'm gonna, I've got beef with the French. But, uh, yeah, the French, I mean, they're probably the most... Them and the Swedes are probably the most suicidal group in Europe these days. Yeah, I throw in pretty much all the Scandinavian countries at this point. Which, I mean, and they're the last outposts of people having uh, examples of where socialism works. And what's going to be the undoing of all those countries is demographics. Uh, they're, I mean, <laughs> not sure how accurate this is, but I think a couple of years ago in Oslo, Norway, there was not one Norwegian accused of rape. All the rapes were by refugees and immigrants. And that's happening all over Scandinavia. You know, or, you know, they'll use Norway. Well, here's where socialism works. Like, well, Norway, I think, has fewer people than the Atlanta metro area. And they're sitting on huge oil reserves. And for the time being, they're eth- ethnically pretty much homogenous. Those factors might have a lot more to do with their success than socialism. I think socialism eventually and was a Margaret Thatcher. You want, you eventually wind up uh, running out of other people's money. And uh, I think uh, in, in Scandinavia, it's, you get, the problem's going to be they're going to run out of Scandinavians. And do you have an early pick for maybe who the Democratic frontrunner may be in 2020? I think they'll probably try Bernie Sanders again. He might be uh, sclerotic at that point. Um what are they saying? Kamala Harris. I don't know anything about her. Um, I think they fucked up again. It was Keith Ellison almost became the DNC chairman, like a, a black Muslim who used to have ties with the nation of Islam. That would have been really dumb, but instead they picked some radical labor organizer named Perez. They remain hostile toward whites. And it's like, well, whites are still the majority, whether you like it or not. Uh, you're going to alienate a lot of people and probably lose votes if you keep up with that. I wish they could. I wish everyone could drop it, but uh, I'm not dumb enough to think that they will. Uh, uh, tribalism is an instinct. It's one that I'm thankfully largely free of. No matter how much I get accused of being a white nationalist, white supremacist, Nazi, all I do, I, you know, as far as I see, I point out hypocrisies in the whole narrative. Most white people were not descendants of slaves. Much more likely to be descendants of indentured servants and convict laborers and coal miners. That's where I call bullshit. Um, you know, people, why don't you cr- criticize these Christian Republicans? It's like I did that 30 years ago when there were satanic panics and, you know, uh, book burnings and, and uh, parents music resource centers trying to censor records. They don't have the cultural power that they did. That's why I don't criticize them anymore. Uh, I mean, my beef isn't left. It's with sanctimonious people because they're pricks. <laughs> and uh, most of the sanctimony these days is heavily weighted toward the left. And what would Trump have to do to not get reelected at this point? <laughs> um, you know, I think I think 
I suspect what's going to happen is there's going to be another recession or depression. And if anything kills them, that would be it. And uh, I always think it's unfair to blame or credit a president for what happens on their watch because these are factors that were set in motion long before they took office. And uh, But that debt, I mean, Obama promised to have the national debt. He doubled it. And I don't know how they're going to dig out of that. So I think uh, it may be things beyond his control. If he keeps on being a dick, um, I don't think he'll be beaten. <laughs> and to their chagrin, I think, uh, well, I mean, Bush didn't win the popular vote in 2000. He won it in 2004. I think if these these little babies keep throwing tantrums and flinging monkey poo all over the place, I think uh, they're spelling their own demise. The resistance. Or, you know, you, have you seen this picture of Keith Olbermann? Looking like a homeless person sitting on the ground, like draped in an American flag, looking demented and schizophrenic and not a good look. This resist. I'm part of the. What are you resisting? Getting a job? Like What, what exactly? And, you know, I ask these people, how how is he going to really affect your life negatively besides you don't like his style? And I've never really gotten, a, oh, he's going to put gay people in concentration. It's like, you're nuts. You never said anything like that. You know, um. I'd really like to get an answer. Like, how is he, besides, again, like, it's shattering your idea that you were on the wrong side of history and these were wars that will never be fought again. How is he harming you? Are these people harming themselves. They're, they're throwing tantrums over nothing, really. I remember the, the morning, because <laughs> I was in New York election night, and uh, I didn't expect him to win. We went out to this party at like 9 p.m. and oh, you know, Clinton's ahead in Florida and Ohio. I'm like, oh, it's over. But we went to this bar and like, and it was a Trump gathering, and I heard the cheers getting louder. And wow, 2 a.m. Wow, he won. That's that's amazing. Went out to breakfast in Brooklyn the next morning. I'm sitting in like outside, and some woman goes by on the phone. She's like, and all the harm and he's going to do to the people in this. And I, I just I said, ha ha, cry, cry. I want you to cry. I said it right to her. It's like, because you fuckers have messed with my life actively and sadistically for decades. I want you to know what it feels like now. Then maybe you'll be cool. Or maybe not. <laughs> maybe it's a bit hypocritical, but uh, not, not if your program is uh, maintaining self-interest. Then it's totally in line with it. These people acted actively against me based on my genitalia and my skin for most of my life. And... Uh, you know, when there's a backlash, uh, the only thing that uh, confuses me why they didn't expect it. Just like when uh, 9-11 happened. I was aware that uh, sanctions against Iraq led to the starvation deaths of about a million Iraqi women and children. What the hell do they expect? Them to just take it? And that, then you get into, oh, you're saying we deserved it? It's like, no, nah, that's kind of a biblical way of looking at it. I believe in cause and effect, though. You can't just go bomb the hell out of people and starve them and not expect somebody to try to do it back. And that's, that's, you know, it's, oh, it's a reaction. It's, it's against the course of history. It's like, no, nah, this might, I think your whole perception of history might be off. There might be a little more life in the people you were beating down than you expected. And they're shocked. And they are like pearl clutching, vapor sniffing, fainting church ladies with all this. They get offended. I mean, the air offends them. I, I always say I'm bothered by everything. I'm a curmudgeon. I'm cranky. <laughs> Shit bothers me. Offended. I can't be offended because I mean how, how would you be offended everything someone could say it's it's part of the universe it's part of the you know the murder rape racism whatever you think is horrible it all, it all happens I just see it as you know another day nothing offends me no no ideas especially but these people are afraid of their own shadows and I, I just don't think there it can end well or, or you'll you'll wind up with a totalitarian police state where people are jailed for thoughts Oh, you mean like England? <laughs> Canada. I mean, God, there's so many cases up there. What was it? Uh, there was the guy, I think Ezra Levant. He, he had to pay like a quarter million dollars fighting uh, some lawsuit because he actually printed the Muhammad cartoons that caused all the, the ruckus in Denmark. I could be getting some of these facts wrong. But there was a comedian, uh, I think his name was Guy Earl. He, he uh, I think it might have been open mic night at some bar. And there had been a pair of lesbians... According to the, the bar owners, they've been drinking since noon, and they kept heckling him. And he said, well, look at you. No wonder you're lesbians. Look at you. No man would want you. Well, whether you like what he said or not, 
I mean, it may be true. I mean, there are lesbians by necessity because no man wants them. I think that's an unfortunate truth. But um, he was taken before the Canadian Human Rights Commission. He had to pay this huge fine. So what, for telling a joke? When these people were probably calling him much worse? No, nah, I don't want to live in that world. I'm going to live in a world where everyone's free to be Don Rickles and insult the shit out of everyone and no one goes to jail or gets fired over it. I think everyone would be much saner and happier if you could joke around. I said in the Redneck book, you know, uh, 20 years. I, and, and it's funny because recently Mel Brooks said the same thing that I said about Mel Brooks 20 years ago. And, I, and tw- <laughs> in 1996, I said 20 years ago in the early 70s, Mel Brooks and Richard Pryor were doing comedy that would be considered hate speech these days. And Mel Brooks recently said, yeah, I could never do Blazing Saddles again. But I think when you make people so sensitive, you make them insane. I, I'm all for bringing back racial humor, racial jokes, the crudest, phallus stereotypes. Let everyone get it out. And I think you respect each other more. I think, uh, I mean, you know, because, you know, where I come from, hard scrabble, working class, the people insult the shit out of each other and no one gets into fights. They get into fights over other things, you know, women or resources or whatever. But uh, everyone needs to tamp down the sensitivity. It's just making people nuts. And lastly, just to put a big shiny bow on all of this, what would you say is the absolute biggest lesson from what happened in the election of 2016, whether you're Republican, Democrat, whatever? I really think, uh, and I, I still think a lot of people don't see this, I think it unmasked the media as intensely biased. There are people who still, they, uh, the metaphor I keep using is, uh, is it David Foster Wallace, the guy who committed suicide. Um, cause I get criticized all the time. Oh, criticizing political correctness. Ooh, how nineties. Like these people look at everything like a fashion trend, but the thing is political correctness hasn't, uh, hasn't ebbed since the nineties. It's become reality to a lot of people. They've never known any other world. And the David Foster Wallace metaphor, there's two fish swimming in the water, and one says the water feels fine, and the other one says, what's water? He's so familiar with it, it's just, you know, what's political correct? No, that's just reality. And racism and homophobia, and it's real, and only white people, you know, and you, you try to pick apart what they're saying, it doesn't make any sense, but they, they've just been indoctrinated into it. I think, uh, I, I'd like to believe that this was the first uh, and hopefully fatal blow against all that shit. I, I didn't like the Catholicism I grew up with, and I don't like the uh, the politically correct sanctimony that just permeates everything these days. I don't think it's a recipe for uh, for harmony. Not when you, you pretty much stain the largest group in America with original sin. That's a recipe for disaster. And like I said, like either the people who are... <laughs> Or setting this this playing field are either dumb as hell or they know exactly what they're doing and they they have uh, ill will. They they don't really want harmony. Maybe they want to centralize power because if if you're going to create that much conflict, you're going to have to increase government power and surveillance, and pretty much bring in a totalitarian police state just to maintain some semblance of peace. The future will be fun indeed. I hope so. You know, or like the Chinese say, may you live in interesting times. Uh, the times are definitely interesting. And it, it's, it's a Chinese curse, actually. May you live in interesting times. So <laughs> that's the curse we're dealing with. Uh, it'll get better. I'm sure of that. I hope so. That'd I'm be nice. Optimist. That'd, be, that'd be good. I've, uh, <laughs> life has taught me not to be optimistic. But uh, I, again, I, I say almost all the time, I hope I'm wrong. That would be great. Well, we want to thank you so much for taking time to schedule and having this two-hour long interview with us. It's a pleasure, Mr. Gator. Thank you so yes, much. Yes, sir. Thank just, you. Just uh, give you the final word. Any websites, upcoming appearances you want to plug before we go out? Uh, you can just twitter.com slash Jim Go, G-O-A-D. And uh, probably by the end, of the end of the month, I'll finally have the first episode of Jim Go's Group Hug podcast up. I've been waiting for that one very impatiently for. Yeah, and I mean, people people harass me, but it's like, look, motherfuckers, I've worked seven days a week since June of 2010. I've got a full time job in the week, and I do two features every weekend. I don't have a lot of time, you know. It's it's not like I'm sitting around twiddling my thumbs watching TV. I, I work myself to death. This is all extracurricular shit, so they need to be patient, and I want to do it right too. That's why I'm, I bought the sound equipment and. Uh, you know, hired someone to do theme music. I want want to do it well, so they can wait a little bit. You know, I already put two books out this year on top of working seven days a week. Calm down. 
And anytime anyone bugs me about it, I want to postpone it another month. <laughs> It'll be worth the wait. Most yeah, certainly. I hope so. Yeah, and I want to make it funny, and I want to try to make it as apolitical as possible. Because that's, like I said, maybe my hugest beef with the left is they make everything political. They just can't keep their noses out of shit. I want to have fun on this. Well, the world needs you more than ever, Mr. Goad. Once again, <laughs> thank you so much, and we'll be seeing from you thank very you. shortly. All right, man. Take care. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye. Once again, we want to thank Jim Goad for stopping by for this, the inaugural edition of Not Economically Viable. You know, for a guy with a reputation for being aggressive and aggressive and hostile, he actually is one of the nicest guys I've ever interviewed. He's quite possibly the fan for this human being I've ever encountered. He goes out of his way to help up and coming alternative media folks like us, and for that, he deserves all of our respect and reverence, even if you don't agree with his politics. The best way to stay abreast of Goat's happenings and doings is his official website, jimgoat.net. There you'll find links to all of his articles, places to purchase his litany of literary offerings, and get the latest news on his podcast and media appearances. And be sure to check out his weekly writings over at TalkieMag.com and follow him on Twitter at Jim Goat. That is, if you have the balls. Anywho, that's a wrap for this week's Not Economically Viable. Subscribe, bookmark, like, share, whatever the hell it is you can do on the internet these days, and we'll be back shortly with more titillating against the grain tales of contemporary fear and loathing. Hey. Uh, society is crumbling apart, doesn't mean we can't have a little fun playing with the wreckage, right?